You know, this is about when sermons normally occur. <laughs> so uh, maybe this is an appropriate time. It's not going to be a normal sermon, best assured. <laughs> but uh, it is about uh, religion uh, and uh, economics and uh, with a, a whole series of illustrations uh, from free trade. And uh, before I go any further, I do want to thank the uh, Von Mises Institute. I'm very impressed with the facilities here. Jeff Tucker, Lou Rockwell for the invitation. And I've been having a good time. Uh, I've been enjoying the sessions. I noticed uh, the Lincoln session yesterday was didn't quite get as far on the religion front uh, uh, as, uh, I, as I thought would have been appropriate. I mean, it seems to me I'm certainly not the first person uh, to note that Lincoln uh, was America's Christ figure, and uh, he was, uh, you know, he died to save men's souls, and uh, you have to recognize that this metaphor has a certain resonance in Western civilization. And uh, now, I, contrary to some of the suggestions, I don't think Lincoln planned it uh, exactly that way. <laughs> Uh, unless uh, he actually was getting the word from God directly, uh, just like Jesus. But I, I'm, I'm a little skeptical about that. But uh, I have to also point out that, uh, that uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about Lincoln getting his political philosophy and that he should have gotten it from uh, Plato or uh, Aristotle or uh, Thomas Aquinas. Uh, you know, if you if that didn't show much awareness of Western religion. Uh, if you look at uh, Jesus, I didn't notice that uh, he read a lot of philosophy books, and uh, he was kind of born in a manger, and just like Lincoln was born in a log cabin. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, if if you're going to play in this game, you have to understand the metaphors quite well. <laughs> the uh, but anyway. To get uh, beyond that, uh, to, I, I will also make a few uh, prefatory uh, remarks. I started uh, getting into the subject of economics and religion in the 1980s, and uh, it was considered a, somewhat of an odd subject to study, although I had some uh, fairly uh, good reasons. Uh, I mean, I was looking at the time I was involved. I, I'm, I'm a professor of environmental policy, and I've always regarded kind of the clash between economists and environmentalists as a sort of religious war. And so, and fortunately, mostly in symbols and words, uh, not, in, uh, not in actual violence, but uh, still, it had all of that flavor. So I started getting interested in the subject in the uh, mid-1980s. Uh, and I remember that uh, Rick Stroop, who's at the Political Economy Research Center, probably a lot of you know who he is, um, commented to me at the time, he said, you know, this is a strange subject, but you ought to go look at Murray Rothbard, because he actually writes about this subject, too, and he's interested in it. And I did, and I actually followed up, and so uh, he was there first, like he was in a lot of things, but uh, uh, I've carried on at least, uh, maybe not in exactly his vein, but somewhat maybe in his spirit anyway. Uh, I did uh, review his uh, economic his two volumes of his economic history book, uh, it's the longest I've ever spent reading a book to, re to review it in, uh, in my career. Uh, I profited, though, great. I agreed to do it because I knew I would benefit from it. Uh, and, of course, in this book, it did emphasize the interrelations between uh, economics and religion. Uh, Rothbard attacked Adam Smith uh, as a deluded Calvinist and uh, suggested that the prominent role of labor in his economic theorizing was due to his Calvinist propensities, and of course, uh, Calvin believed that you benefited from the labor, not from the consumption, and uh, so there was probably uh, something to that, and uh, I agree also, I mean, uh, Smith is famously anti-Catholic in his uh, commentary, uh, so I think there was a lot to what Rothbard said. I did, however, suggest that he could have put more emphasis. I think he underplayed uh, the importance of Christianity in uh, modern individualism, and especially Protestant Christianity, and above all, uh, Calvinist Christianity. And you could actually make a reasonable argument that modern 
libertarianism and individualism derives significantly from uh, Calvinist roots. And uh, you, if you look at, uh, you know, I mean, who was it that cut off the head of the King of England? Uh, those uh, Puritans who were the Calvinist offshoot uh, of, uh, of, uh, or they, of the, of the, they, the Puritans were the Calvinist, English Calvinist offshoot. And of course, uh, that showed something about their attitude towards authority uh, that we can all symbol, sympathize with here. Uh, but anyway, to get, uh, before I get into free trade specifically, I'll set it up a little bit. Uh, by talking about the subject of economics and religion, which is, Rothbard was there ahead, but it's actually becoming rather fashionable, believe it or not, uh, in intellectual uh, circles these days. Uh, the Templeton Foundation, uh, be the, be the beneficiary of uh, billions of John Templeton's money on the stock market is putting two or three million, right now at this moment, they're putting two or three million uh, into funding studies of religion and economics. Uh, the Pew Foundation is putting money into this area. Um, recently, I was asked uh, by the Journal of Economic Literature to review a book uh, by Rebecca Blank and uh, William McGurn on Is the Market Moral? Uh, a subject that I don't think they would have, 10 years ago, it would have been almost inconceivable. They would have asked, uh, certainly it would have been very unlikely the book would have been written by the way, the answer was yes, but uh, Blank is uh, an MIT PhD who's dean of the Michigan Public Policy School, and McGurn is the chief editorial writer uh, for the Wall Street Journal. But that wasn't why they were asked to work on the book. It was because they're both self-professed devout Christians. Uh, Blank is Protestant and McGurn is Catholic. And they were sought out by Brookings, the Brookings Institution, specifically for this purpose, to write about the question of the morality uh, of the market. Uh, and then Brookings published it as a Brookings Institution Press uh, book. Again, I suggest this is a sign of more <laughs> remarkable change occurring within the uh, discipline of economics in places like the Brookings Institution. Now, among uh, professional economists, uh, the greatest efforts have been made to incorporate religion into an economic framework. Uh, that is, joining a church or believing in a religion can be seen as consumer maximizing utility behavior. Then you can do what economists do, run a bunch of regressions and so forth, and relate uh, in variables like price and income to religious participation and types of belief. It's basically Gary Becker uh, applied to religion. And there's a whole host of students out there now who are getting interested in doing these kinds of things. And the leader is Larry uh, Iannacone, uh, who's now at uh, George Mason Economics Department. And he's basically trying to put, he's pushing the whole field. Now, I'm a small part of this uh, trend myself, but uh, my pro approach has been uh, quite different. Uh, I'm trying to incorporate uh, economics within a theological framework of thought. And so I'm arguing that in the writings that I've done in this area, um, that American economics, which is mainly progressive economics in my terminology, is a form of religion. Of course, it's a secular religion. Uh, it's like the gospel of efficiency, as a lot of historians have referred to uh, the progressive era. Uh, so there's nothing about God of the hereafter, or at least nothing explicitly so in economic religion. And I've written a couple books on this subject, if anyone's interested. I'll take advantage of the audience here and mention that one was in 1991, uh, Reaching for Heaven on Earth, The Theological Meaning of Economics, and the other was in uh, 2001, Economics as Religion, from Samuelson to Chicago and beyond, and there's even a few copies of that one out there at a very cheap price, uh, if anyone was interested in pursuing these, some of these ideas further. Uh, but the first book is largely about secular economic religion uh, before World War II, and the second is mainly uh, after World War II. And again, in terms of this growing interest uh, among historians of economic thought and following in, somewhat in Rothbard's footsteps, 
uh, and also relating to issues of free trade, since we could call the wealth of nations in a way the Bible of free trade. Uh, but there's been a growing interest in the religious elements in Adam Smith, uh, writing in uh, 2001 in the European Journal of the History of Economic Thought, uh, Lisa Hill writes that, quote, Adam Smith's social and economic philosophy is inherently theological and that its providentialist underpinnings cannot be removed without impairing his theory of social order. Uh, as she acknowledges, she's following in the footsteps of uh, one of the leading economists of the 20th century, Jacob Viner, who was also interested in economic unusually so, interested in the relationship between economics and religion, but who, and who also argued that Smith was unintelligible without understanding the theological un assumptions. Still more recently, another historian of economic thought, a pro fairly prominent economist, Anthony Waterman, uh, published a 2002 article in the Southern Economic Journal on, quote, well, the title of the article was, uh, economics as Theology, Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations. And Wa Waterman argues that uh, Smith's grounding of his system in the idea of nature and the workings of nature, when he talks about nature, he really means God. Uh, and, or at least that's the best way to understand it. It's not clear entirely what Smith meant sometimes. But uh, the, as Waterman says in many cases, quote, uh, nature is nearly synonymous with the God referred to in the wealth of nations as the deity. And uh, Waterman notes that the term nature is used uh, 149 times in the wealth of nations. Uh, natural comes up 232 times and naturally is found uh, 272 times. Now, it's used in different senses, and not always, but in many cases it's being used in a teleological or metaphysical and moral uh, sense. Um, now, Mark Thornton uh, met yesterday, talked a little bit about this, and mentioned there is some uh, controversy over the real meaning of the hidden hand, and I'm sure that there are different interpretations. Um, but uh, these authors, and I would tend to agree with them, are basically saying that there is a hidden hand in the wealth of nations and it's hidden because it's really the hand of God. Uh, and that's what puts the whole thing together and makes it make sense. And actually that's why it resonated in his society because Christian culture was pervasive. Uh, but yet people were having growing doubts. So he kind of synthesized the Christian imagery but within, in a sort of a scientific set of metaphors. Uh, and that was the key to his uh, success. Um, so, and if you look at what uh, uh, the, uh, of course, Smith's uh, commands of God are not found in the Bible. They're found in his interpretation of the natural world. Uh, so society follows, is in, in Smith's uh, portrayal, the laws of self-interest, uh, which is the equivalent of gravity in the solar system, and it, it has a similar, te similar tendency towards equilibrium. And thus, Smith has revealed the true social order of nature uh, as Newton revealed the true social order of the solar system and of the physical world. And in fact, Smith uh, saw himself in terms of Newton, saw himself in a way, as the Newton of society. Uh, so you could say in this sense that uh, Smith was the revealer of a new, uh, new religion. Uh, he had revealed the real plan of, the, of God for the world, um, and, but it's not really a Christian God. And so in a sense, you could call it a Christian variation or heresy or whatever, or perhaps, uh, although I'm sure it could be interpreted in, a, in, in some Christian frameworks. Uh, but uh, I think it's actually a strain. And another, again, reflecting the increasing amount of writing on these kinds of subjects, uh, another uh, intellectual historian, Peter uh, Minowitz, in a book which is I recommend, it's a 1993 book about Adam Smith's thinking, says that uh, Smith is basically non-Christian or even anti-Christian in his explicit language, although he's under in, a, in, a, in, a, in an understated or a uh, implicit way borrowing heavily from Christian thinking. Now, so this illustrated what I would say has been a common theme 
um, of the whole modern age. Uh, a lot of the greatest fi intellectual figures of the age, looking back now, and we're starting to have a little more perspective on them than we had, uh, took Christian themes and they recast them in secular language, uh, sometimes even condemning Christianity, as Marx, for example, did, as the opiate of the masses, even when you actually look at it now in retrospect, it clearly is a, is a variant of uh, Christian thinking. And uh, this also, you know, at least in, in my interpretation, we could have a lot of discussions, uh, explains the success of a lot of these thinkers because basically they were operating in a culture that was suffused with Christian assumptions and values, but they, so they were translating these to, though, to a new and more acceptable, quote, scientific uh, language. And so in the uh, 18th century, we saw the beginnings of this emergence of secular religion as a challenger to and eventually even a victor over uh, traditional Christianity in, in many forums, especially in terms of the governance of public life. Um, so Rousseau was one of the first and was uh, tremendously influential. Smith came later. Uh, Karl Marx uh, uh, followed, uh, produced another powerful secular religion. Paul Tillich once described Marx as the most influential theologian in Western civilization since the uh, uh, Reformation. He wasn't talking about um, Marx's brilliant logic, which obviously, or I uh, which uh, which was uh, actually terrible, uh, but is, but he was talking about a message that stirred. Uh, such powerful religious emotions and Marxism resonated in the Christian civilization because it was already very familiar uh, with the main themes. There's another book talking again about this, the development of this recent literature uh, by an Israeli historian, Egal Halfen, who interprets the uh, history of communism as in Russia as basically a misguided working out of a religious revolution. It was nominally atheistic, but the underlying messages were historically Christian. Uh, as Higa, as uh, uh, Halfen explains, the Marxist, con quote, the Marxist concept of universal history was essentially inspired by the Judeo-Christian bracketing of historical time between the fall of man and the apocalypse. Uh, and uh, so he goes on and basically shows that the I Marxist ideas as es eschatological ideas uh, had an enormous impact even in the development of Russian society and the details of uh, organization and Marxist ideology. So uh, I've made, again, uh, I'd say a small contribution uh, to this trend and uh, wrote about Smith a bit in the book Reaching for Heaven on Earth. Uh, I suggested along with Rothbard that there were strong elements of Calvin uh, but also Thomas Aquinas and that in some ways you could interpret Smith as being a, his magic formula was that he synthesized uh, Calvin and Aquinas in language and metaphors that were uh, increasingly suitable to a secular age. Now, you could say that this is all of historical interest, especially with Smith. I mean, maybe Smith was theological. I think it's a, there's a very strong case. But uh, maybe his arguments can just as well be made now without any theology. Uh, maybe uh, God or no God, uh, the market system is still the most efficient way of organizing a modern economy. Um, but I may doubt, and I question in my writings, uh, that you can dispense so easily with religion. And uh, the, fir the full argument is in the second book, Economics as Religion, but I'll illustrate the argument uh, with respect to the topic of free trade, which is the uh, assignment I have uh, today. And I'm going to suggest that it t there are necessary theological assumptions in order to make the argument um, for f free trade full and convincing. <coughs> That is to say, belief in free trade has to rest on a normative uh, foundation. You can start off by noting that uh, free trade is a universalist uh, vision. The whole world uh, should become free traders. 
And then it'll bring everybody together in an economic community of common bonds. In this respect, actually, it's a bit like Christianity, which, unlike uh, many other religions, was universalistic and sought to convert the whole world. Other people, like the Japanese, have almost no desire to go out uh, and convert other people to their own value system. In fact, they want to stay as far away from other people as possible. And their preference would probably be to just be Japan by themselves. Uh, but in the West, and also Islam, which is a biblical religion, uh, there's a constant uh, missionary character. Uh, it's interesting, when the World Bank sends out teams these days to less developed countries, they actually call them missions. And uh, the, uh, they're spreading uh, the ideas of economic progress to the world. Uh, the... Uh, so, and Adam Smith argued just that, that free trade would promote bonds of friendship and community, and this was a critical element. Uh, and in fact, it was kind of essential to the whole enterprise, because if we look uh, at history, uh, you know, we see that the history of the world, of tribes and nations, is one of war and conflict, often, you know, disastrous. Uh, and so, uh, in advocating free trade, you have to be assuming that somehow economic progress will cure nations of this kind of bad behavior. Uh, commerce will take the place of war. We can talk about this uh, with the illustration of the case of China, uh, just to bring, bring it up to a very current and practical example. Uh, most free traders would celebrate uh, the widening of trade relations with China. It's not just the cheap goods for the United States. The assumption is that China is being drawn into the world community of nations. And as China trades more and more, it gets richer and richer. We assume that China will become more democratic. We assume it will become more cooperative and rational as a nation. We assume that Mao Zedong was an aberration uh, that could not happen again in the new freight, free trading and much richer China. Now, I'd say, you know, this idea that we're changing the Chinese and their behavior in some fundamental sense as a nation is already getting rather religious. It has overtones of salvation. Uh, and, uh, the, uh, and it's making assumptions about the economic progress that go well beyond total individual utilities. But it is basically just an assumption. Uh, we don't really know. I mean, think of an alternative scenario. China could get rich, but still think the Chinese are the center of the earth and superior to all other nations. They might build up a big uh, army and navy. Uh, it might then turn out that free trade had made China powerful in order to threaten the United States. And uh, the Marxists used to say uh, that a capitalist will sell you the rope to hang him. And uh, maybe, uh, you know, maybe we're creating a China uh, which is eventually going to uh, pose a, 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 we don't know. I mean, uh, this is where the assumptions come in and the uh, assumptions about economics and the effect of economics on national and individual character. Uh, but for me, I, I can only promote enthusiastically endorse the idea of building up China if I feel fairly confident that it's going to become a cooperative member of the world community of nations. Uh, Adam Smith would have assumed that that was the case. Most free traders implicitly assume it, but we don't know. Uh, this is part of the idea that uh, economic progress is not only materially uplifting, but morally uplifting. Uh, and this is... Uh, Again, this, this Chinese example is just an illustration of one of the main themes I emphasize in my writing. Uh, in Christianity, original sin was in the fall in the Garden of Eden. In economic religion, uh, there's another equivalent uh, to original sin. It's economic deprivation. Uh, why do people uh, lie, cheat, and steal? Economic religion says it's because of uh, poverty. That's why China behaved so badly before, because they were so poor. But now that they get rich, they'll become model world citizens. Uh, and so the salvation of the world, then, is to eliminate material deprivation, and that's where free trade comes in. Um, as I don't have any question, 
uh, free trade is the best root of rapid economic progress. Uh, so free trade becomes the root of moral and spiritual uplift if that's what economic progress does to people. Uh, it's actually uh, the way to banish bad behavior or in a Christian framework, evil actions in the world, uh, or that is to say, again, in a Christian terminology, to save the world. But of course, we don't need a God, Christian God to do it if it actually can be done through economic means. Um, and we see these kinds of assumptions in the United States. Why do people commit crime in the inner cities? Because they're poor. Uh, we want to solve crime. We solve poverty. Uh, and everything will be fine. And uh, again, it's economic theology, if you want to call it that. So uh, I'm going to switch a bit now and, and look at another aspect of this, which is also going to involve the interaction of uh, theology you know, or religion and free trade. Uh, what about the effects of free trade internally in the United States? Uh, does free trade really make us uh, better off? Uh, and I'm not also talking about whether, going back to my China discussion, whether a richer uh, United States will be a more peaceful and cooperative member of the world community of nations, although uh, I know that a lot of people in Europe and around the world are wondering about that these days, looking at Iraq and so forth. Uh, but uh, I'm actually going to ask the question of whether the U.S. is better just in terms of the welfare of its citizens as a result of free trade. And I suggest the answer is less obvious uh, than many economists have argued. It only becomes obvious if you actually make some normative assumptions about progress and the benefits of progress uh, and that are not really as obvious as some people have taken uh, for granted. Um, the, uh, uh, and so I'm not questioning that goods from China are cheaper. I mean, I go to Walmart too. I'm aware of uh, what, go, what you get in Walmart. Uh, but I'm asking whether, uh, and I'm not questioning that Americans in terms of total consumption get more for, as a result of free trade. They do, as far as I'm concerned anyway. Uh, but I, my interest and concern is what you could call the uh, cost of transition. Uh, there's a lot of turmoil and economic upset associated with the market in general and with free trade in particular. Uh, even people who don't uh, lose their jobs experience a lot of anxiety about the possibility. Uh, and we're seeing increasing evidence in the United States that people don't like change, especially having to look for a new job. Or, uh, and maybe it's because we're already so rich. I mean, by any previous historical standards, we're richer than kings. So, you know, maybe uh, with well, the idea is that, hey, what, you know, how much more do we need? It'd be better to just have a job. And, uh, and have a stable situation. Uh, so, and there's a, actually this fits into, there's a new academic field, it's called happiness studies. And it uh, stems from, it stems from Richard Easterlin. He wrote a classic 19, article in the 1970s. Easterlin found that as people got richer within a country, they reported significantly higher happiness scores. That is, you feel good if you're rich and your other people in your country are poor. But what he found, which was rather remarkable, was that when whole nations got richer, their happiness scores didn't correlate with their income. <laughs> and uh, so the, uh, it, it's a rather disconcerting result in terms of free trade, since the whole point of it is to make nations richer. But if they don't get happier, happiness was the goal that Adam Smith had in mind, this would seem to be at least modest empirical questioning of the whole point of the exercise. Uh, and now that people have even gone to measure it. They actually have happiness scores and then they do regression analyses and they correlate happiness with things like your income, uh, your uh, education, your sex, uh, your age, and all these other things. Uh, and so they use the best statistics which are available. Um, and just a recent article, 2004 article in the Journal of Public Economics says that um, losing a job has the equivalent effect on happiness as gaining or losing $60,000 on average. Uh, so that means free trade is going to have to produce a lot of benefits 
uh, in terms of cheaper goods, of prices of goods, in order to compensate for that, if you multiply by all the jobs that are displaced and so forth. Interestingly, uh, just to give you the flavor of this, they also estimate that it uh, takes, on average, $100,000 to make up for a divorce. <laughs> so, uh, the, again, it shows that change in people's lives is difficult. And any system uh, which imposes large amounts of change is going to have a lot of stress and strain. There's a new book out uh, by one of the uh, more distinguished British economists. He's even Lord Richard Laird. Uh, it's published just a month or two ago, in 2005. It's called Happiness, Lessons from the New Science. Now, remember, Adam Smith is basically all about happiness when you really get down to it and how to maximize it in the world, or at least that was what he said he was doing, is maximizing self-interest, but presumably to make you happier, to maximize your utility. Utility is just another word for happiness, uh, a little more formal and academic sounding. Um, so people are actually trying to look at this now. And, but it raises points uh, and issues with respect to free trade. Um, why is free trade so great if it involves all this disruption? And economists have certainly never made any attempts to measure uh, the losses from the disruption and to compare them with the benefits in total consumption. Uh, they just take it for granted. That's just an automatic assumption. You could call it an article of religious faith, uh, that the gains overall are greater than the losses to the individuals who lose. Uh, even though the individual losers are, are probably experiencing much bigger losses than the individual gainers from the trade, at least in, in, in the short run. Uh, so why is free trade so important? Well, again, I, I would say it comes back to the argument I've been making that if you believe in economic progress and that economic progress is a way to make people better and make nations better, uh, to more, not just materially uplift people, but to morally uplift people, then free trade makes perfect sense. I mean, why worry about these temporary stresses and strains uh, when we're on the road to perfecting the human condition? Or, as I put it in my first book, when we're reaching for heaven on earth uh, and there's some possibility uh, of actually getting there. So on this road, we'll want to uh, move as rapidly as possible. Uh, those people who complain about being disrupted and losing their jobs, I mean, they're like people who want, you know, they're uh, evil people who are violating the religion in a certain sense. They're, they're malingerers. Why would anyone complain about having to bear some temporary stress uh, if they're uh, if the world and this free trading system is actually going to solve all the historic, most severe problems that have afflicted the human, <coughs> human beings in the past, such as war uh, and crime and all kinds of other things, which will gradually disappear uh, as we maximize our uh, material wealth. And you can uh, draw some parallels with uh, Christianity in this regard in the Middle Ages also, uh, the religious purpose was a heaven on the, was to get to heaven, but it was in the hereafter rather than here on earth. Uh, ordinary people were often tempted uh, by easy pleasures. Sin was easy to follow. Kings and other political leaders often ignored their Christian responsibilities. Uh, the priesthood had to remind them of their duties and their obligations. But it is in, the, in medieval religion and as uh, no one should reasonably sacrifice a heavenly future for a few short-run pleasures uh, of the moment. And like Christianity, economics always emphasizes that it's about the long run. Uh, although Keynes did say that in the long run we'll all be dead, he was trying to uh, actually argue with the prevailing way that most economists were thinking and then still do in considerable part. When they focus on equilibrium, for example, uh, that's worrying about the long run and not about how we get there and what the path is and what the qualities of the path are like. And so, but that all makes sense if progress is a transcendent value. Uh, then all of these lost jobs and other transitional costs in the short run, reasonably enough, uh, can be ignored. So to repeat my point, 
uh, economic progress, maybe. I wouldn't actually, I'm not really even intending to dismiss this. Maybe it's true, although I have my doubts, as you might suspect. But I'm not saying it's wrong. Uh, it's just I'm saying it's an article of faith. We don't, I don't really know whether economic progress actually has all these great benefits. There's a lot, certainly some reasons to doubt it, uh, but there's also some reasons to believe it. And, but it's an article of faith that has to go with the whole system, or else the system starts to unravel. And, uh, the, uh, uh, and if, uh, if economic progress is not what it's really cracked up to be, uh, then free, the case for tree, free trade be, has to shift from what it's historically been presented. It doesn't necessarily go away, but it needs at least to be modified, and it becomes more complicated. Now, I think this issue is arising because for much of the 20th century, you were a bit of a crackpot if you questioned progress. Uh, I mean, everybody took it for granted. I mean, it was, it was part of the American religion. I mean, Abraham Lincoln was part of this in his own way. And, uh, he symbolized it. And, uh, but now a lot of people are questioning it, especially environmentalists. And so it's not, uh, this is part of the religious war between environmentalists and believers in economic progress as a redeeming feature of life. And uh, it's not coincidental uh, that environmentalists are the fervent, you know, the leading opponents of the uh, merits of globalization. They're not actually stupid. They're simply saying that some of them are not very good at articulating, and I have to admit, so maybe they are stupid. <laughs> but, uh, but implicitly what they're saying is that progress is not what it's cracked up to be, uh, and uh, it doesn't really redeem people. Uh, and uh, so therefore globalization is not as important as a lot of people are suggesting it is. And when you look at things like progress, I mean, people are undoubtedly influenced <laughs> by things like the 9-11 terrorist attacks. I mean, uh, uh, it raises ambiguities about progress. With modern science, all it takes now is a few nutcases, and they can destroy thousands of people and possibly even millions of people. So, uh, you know, this fear that science is kind of a Faustian bargain has become much more uh, widespread. And, of course, science is obviously associated uh, with progress. So uh, that's sort of my metaphysical uh, theological discussion. I, I will switch gears and finish up with a few uh, more pragmatic observations uh, on the connection between religion and free trade. And again, uh, I'll uh, uh, refer to an existing body of work among economists. Um, the uh, economists of in the 1990s got interested in the subject of social capital. Uh, I mentioned spiritual capital being, you know, which the social capital is a broader thing. It's basically that a, I mean, to take a simple example, a language. Uh, a language is a form of social capital. Nobody creates it exactly, nobody invests in it, but yet a, a language is a tremendously efficient thing. It even is tremendously beneficial to the economy. The spread of English around the world is a form of social capital which is greatly and rapidly reducing transactions costs. But nobody planned it, nobody invested in it. It just happens and is happening. Uh, but there's all kinds of forms of social capital. And uh, economists are saying, well, you know, we actually need to start studying the social capital as well as physical capital and human capital in the form of education. Uh, so maybe uh, to have a free trading system, I mean, we need some worldwide social capital. Is one way of thinking of it anyway. I mean, to have a good system of free trade, property rights need to be enforced across borders. Trade agreements need to be established. Cheating on these agreements uh, needs to be policed. There's a whole set of things that have to happen. I mean, free trade is not tr world anarchy. Uh, it's actually a managed system uh, of markets, but with laws or arrangements, institutional arrangements, actually, uh, in, <laughs> whatever, for better or worse, John Maynard Keynes was the leading architect of the post-World War uh, free trading regime, which has been enormously successful in terms of economic progress, if that's what you're looking for. And, uh, but hopefully, uh, you know, within this system, most people will behave in a reasonable fashion on a voluntary basis. 
That is, we don't have to force them by threatening to punish them. They actually believe in it and they want to contribute to it and be part of it. Um, so uh, how would we get this kind of behavior? Uh, I mean, there are, as I've mentioned before, a lot of losers in trade, uh, a lot of people who might be angry uh, about the results, uh, who might protest it. Uh, well, one way historically that you build up social capital, or in this case world capital of a social nature, is through a religion, uh, which would suggest uh, that you need some kind of world religious or backing, uh, again, referring back to some of my earlier themes, uh, as a normative foundation. Uh, some people might you know, prefer the word ideology, but I think that's actually um, uh, the, the religion, and, the, and I've had arguments with people, probably some of you would argue with me, but, uh, that, uh, uh, but I think religion is the most accurate word. Uh, and uh, if we were going to say, what's the religion going to be that's going to cre create a set of world bonds that are going to combat opportunism, to use a piece of economic uh, lingo these days, or to maintain trust, to provide that social capital foundation for world trading, uh, what's the common belief system? Well, the only one I can see right now, although maybe I'm wrong, this is kind of, this will be my last point at the end, uh, the only one I can see is this belief in economic progress. So whether it's valid or not, and I have said that it's easy to wonder about it, uh, it does seem to be the essential normative foundation uh, right now. And uh, now there are, it is possible to imagine uh, some other normative foundations. Uh, the, uh, you could go back and say uh, that God is a free trader. And maybe you could find justification in the Bible. And economic progress is a secular religion. We might be able to find uh, justification. Uh, in traditional religion for the principles of free trade. I haven't really explored that subject uh, in great depth. I'm probably skeptical, but uh, probably not impossible. Uh, and it's, in effect, what I've been suggesting is that in a somewhat secularized way, that was essentially what Adam Smith was arguing, was that God basically had established this system. It was the proper way of, of ordering relationships among human beings. Uh, if we were worried about China, we didn't have to worry because God had it. He knew what was going to happen, and China was taken care of in the grand plan. And uh, so we can rest at ease about this issue that I raised before. Uh, and so in that vision, it wouldn't be economic progress that would protect us against China. It would be, uh, and its benefits and its impact on China it would be a divine intervention. Um, so that's an option. Uh, I guess... If you had asked me, I guess as a somewhat libertarian, although you might wonder based on all my comments here, uh, the, uh, uh, if I guess I would argue if I, if I had to at this point make an argument, a fundamental argument for uh, free trade, it would basically come down to the principle of ordering society based on voluntary consent as individuals. And frankly, I don't care as much whether it actually produces a tremendous rate of economic progress or not. Uh, so maybe I'm a departure in this respect. Uh, and uh, so it's really the principle of individual freedom and, and not being oppressed by government, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so I guess uh, maybe you could say that uh, I have a libertarian God, um, but... Uh, whether it's uh, a Christian, economic, libertarian, or whatever, uh, it does seem to me that you're going to have to defend free trade in terms of some normative principles. And those principles are not just scientific. And uh, that could be uh, the big question for the 20th century, as I said and here. What God will it be? I don't know. <laughs> But anyway, I'm trying to raise some questions about it. Anyway, that's, that's all I have to say. <laughs>
you know, your comments reflect very much Rothbard's concern that we defend economic freedom not based on its, on its power to develop economies, but, but based on, on human freedom and voluntarism. That's what I always find. Is that somebody's always <laughs> said these things, and, and Rothbard is one of the leading likely candidates. Let me ask you something, though. And, and, uh, I recently read this 1965 Vatican document called Gaudium et Spes, uh, the Church of the Modern World. And you find here just a, 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 a very aggressive defense of technology, of globalization, of progress, of material progress, of, of sort of an anthropocentric document, and, and a sort of politically incorrect. Well, it was well, that was right after Vatican II, I guess. Which some people would say Vatican II was the conquest of the Catholic Church by modern attitudes, and modern attitudes are fundamentally grounded. And I mean, you cannot separate sort of modernity and the way it has evolved and so forth from the idea of economic progress, right from Adam Smith through Karl Marx to John Maynard Keynes and so forth. Yeah. Well, it's. Yeah, well, I think it was uh, the Catholic Church has not responded to, has not generally been on the cutting edge of intellectual trends. Uh, and uh, they're more likely, I think, to be found at the tail end, just when something is about to die. It's about when they're likely to come to it. So uh, the, that would be uh, one hypothesis, let's put it. Yeah, that's okay, so true. Say that the Austrian case for free trade wouldn't, kind of echoing what you both said, the Austrian case for free trade, my understanding, doesn't rely on happiness. I think there is a religious component in there, but it's, it's the notion that violating property rights is unjust as a sin. Um, in other words... Vi right, but the violation itself is the moral offense. Right. But that's a powerful assumption. I mean, you know, obviously a lot of other people aren't going to necessarily accept that. Now, if we, if we stop plundering people and violating their property rights, that doesn't guarantee that then they will use that freedom to become happy people, which there is a will, but at least we won't have, you know, we, we won't be... Involved. Right. But how can I trade with China unless I don't, there's not a fairly elaborate institutional apparatus to help me do that? And also even including guarantees that I can enforce my property rights if the Chinese company tries to cheat on me and so forth. Well, we would see Austrians would make a case for the, um, that, that uh, you don't need a, a centrally planned uh, law, right. including international trade law. These things can arise spontaneously. True. And we haven't actually gone the way of world government, which is what a lot of people are advocating in circa 1945. I think Right. Yeah, I mean, and certainly in terms of the <coughs> discussion in the book, yeah, the, probably the greatest debt is to Stoicism and Roman, you know, Roman uh, thinkers and not much to Thomas Aquinas. <laughs> but, of course, a lot of our Roman thinking evolved and got to Adam Smith actually through the medieval Catholic Church. Uh, so I would actually argue that he... He was rather slanderous, actually, although there's plenty to criticize about the Catholic Church. I don't think he actually recognized the centrality of the role that it had played, including even trans the mechanism of transmission of, of Stoic kinds of thinking to some extent and through natural law. And you could argue that, I mean, this is what I had argued in this first book, that Smith was kind of a, as I say, a, a synthesis of 
Protestant individualism uh, and with sort of a natural law tendency and all of his references to nature, well, he doesn't use the word natural law. Uh, they kind of resonated with people because that's how actually in the mind of the average reader, that's how they, they, that's how they converted him. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, he, knew, he was too sophisticated to, and too anti-Catholic <laughs> to do that, but he essentially devised a somewhat, you could even call it deceptive terminology, which invoked natural law without actually explicitly saying it so he could deny it if necessary, but then rested on the moral power of that idea in Western civilization. So that's my theory. <laughs>